In a very interesting and exciting result, it turns out that context-free grammars and non-deterministic push-down automata have exactly the same expressive power. Neither is more or less powerful than the other. Both context-free grammars and non-deterministic push-down automata describe the same class of languages. In this video and the next, we're going to uh, discuss the proof of that. Uh, the proof is a little bit complex, so I've broken it into two videos. Here is a statement of the theorem. A language is context-free if and only if some push-down automaton recognizes it. In other words, the class of context-free languages is exactly the same class of languages as those languages accepted by a non-deterministic push-down automaton. The proof really has two parts. Okay, given a context-free language, there is, it has a grammar by definition. If it's a context-free language, it has a grammar. Given the grammar, we need to show how to construct a push-down automaton that recognizes it. That's part one of the proof. And part two is that given a push-down automaton, we can show how to construct the context-free grammar that it recognizes the same language. Part one and part two are converses. It's an if and only if theorem. Okay, a language is context-free if and only if some push-down automaton recognizes it. So we have to go both directions. If it's context-free, we have to show that there's a push-down automaton that recognizes the language. And conversely, if, there's, if it's a language that's recognized by a push-down automaton, then we have to show there's a context-free grammar for it. So part one is, given the context-free grammar, show that there is a push-down automaton. And it's a proof by construction. We'll just show how to build a push-down automaton that recognizes it. And part two, in the other direction, is going from the push-down automaton in the other direction back to the context-free grammar. So in part two, we are given a push-down automaton, and we show how to construct a context-free grammar that's equivalent, that recognizes the same set of strings. Both these parts are a little bit long and involved, so in this video I'm going to look at part one. Given the context-free grammar, we're going to talk about the algorithm for turning it into a push-down automaton. And then in the subsequent video, we'll show the reverse direction. Here's a grammar, an example grammar. So given a grammar like this, we want to show how to find or build an equivalent push-down automaton. And don't worry too much about the details of the grammar. Uh, it's the idea here that we're more concerned about. Now, if a string is part of this language, that means that that string has a derivation using this grammar. It has a parse tree or a, or a leftmost derivation or rightmost derivation, however you want to say it. Uh, so let's consider the leftmost derivation of some string that's in this language. If a string is in this language that's described by this context-free grammar, then there will be a leftmost derivation using the rules of this grammar. Okay, so here's an example string in this grammar, and uh, the, the terminals of this grammar are uh, 0 and 1 and 2, and at the beginning of the derivation we start with a start symbol, and at each step we apply one of the rules, and at the bottom we end up with a string of terminals. And since this is a leftmost derivation, at each step in the, in the derivation, we're always expanding the leftmost non-terminal. So here's our first step, there's only one non-terminal. In the second step, we're ex expanding b using the rule b goes to bb1. And then we have two b's plus an s at that point. So now we always choose the leftmost and we use the rule b goes to 2, and we keep going, and gradually, once uh, part of the sentential form is turned into non-terminals, we keep moving to the right. Okay, So notice how we're sort of accumulating a bunch of terminals on the left-hand side, and the leftmost non-terminal is gradually moving to the right. And here at the end, finally, uh, we replace the last rightmost, the last non-terminal. Uh, in this case, we're using the rule a goes to epsilon, a goes to epsilon. 
So at any stage in this leftmost derivation or any leftmost derivation of a grammar, we've got a sentential form such as 2, B, 1, S. We've got some terminals and non-terminals mixed together, but in particular we've got some non-terminals that precede the leftmost non-terminal. So we've got several at this stage here, 2, 2, 1, A, we've got three non we've got three terminal symbols that precede the non the leftmost non-terminal. In general, which I've tried to suggest down here, we have a bunch of terminals followed by the leftmost non-terminal, followed by some other stuff which can contain both terminals and non-terminals. So the way our pushdown automaton is going to work is it's going to take a string and it's going to find the leftmost derivation. Okay, it's going to reconstruct this leftmost derivation. And if it's able to reconstruct the leftmost derivation, that is, if it's able to start with a string of terminals and work back up to the starting non-terminal S, then it will accept the string. So here's a, a diagram of our pushdown automaton. At any stay, step in the computation, it has already scanned some of the string, and those are necessarily terminal symbols. And it's using its stack. So and, and the way it's using its stack is it's representing the, senten the sentential form in the derivation as the terminals that have already been scanned followed by the other stuff, the rest, I call it, which is pushed onto the stack. So the stack will hold the rest, the stuff that we still need to work on, so to speak. So basically this pushdown automaton works like a parser. It's a non-deterministic parser, so it has a lot of power that way, but it's still a parser. It finds a leftmost derivation. Parsers find parse trees, or they find leftmost derivations, or, or possibly they find rightmost derivations, but in any case, they find a way to prove that the string of terminals is accepted by the grammar. In this case, we'll find the leftmost derivation with our pushdown automaton. Okay, continuing with the example, I'm showing in a little bit more detail how we are storing a sentential form in the derivation in the pushdown automaton's stack and where it is in the input. This is not exactly the same sentential form from the previous slide. I've shortened it to make it fit on the screen here, but uh, this, the idea is the same. Okay, here's the leftmost derivation. Here's some stage in the leftmost derivation where we have a sentential form that has a bunch of terminals followed by some stuff that includes the leftmost non-terminal. And at that stage in the computation done by the pushdown automaton, we've got that sentential form represented. We've already scanned some terminal symbols. Okay, I've represented them with A, 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 A. And we have the rest of the stuff, which contains, among other things, the leftmost non-terminal that hasn't yet been looked at. And so here's the stack. Uh, I've turned the stack on its side to make it clear that the sentential form is here and here. Okay, B, A, B, C. But the stack is shown uh, with the top here being the leftmost non-terminal. At each step of the computation, what we're doing is we're working backwards in this in this leftmost derivation, and we're um, expanding the the the. Well, we're, we're sort of working forward in the leftmost derivation by expanding this b into whatever b expands to and then we're scanning those symbols. So I don't know what the rule for B is, but whatever B expands to next in the step, we, we expand it and then we look for those symbols in the input. So let's say the rule for B is B goes to A, S, A, X, B, A. Well, at that stage in the computation, what we do is we take the B and re replace it with the right hand side. And so now on the stack we've got what we had before, the a b little a b c, 
but we've replaced the, the leftmost non-terminal with its right-hand side, and now our stack has ASA, X, BA, and the stuff we had before. So the steps that we follow in this computation are these. We match the stack top to a rule, and in particular, in particular the left-hand side of the rule, and then we pop it. So we matched the B, we popped it, and we pushed onto the stack the right-hand side of the rule. So we push onto the stack the right-hand side of this rule. So here's the kind of thing we're going to do in the pushdown automaton that we are designing. If we've got a rule with some non-terminal like A going to some right-hand side, like BCD, we're going to add an edge to our finite control for the pushdown automaton. Okay, we're not going to do anything to the input, we're not going to advance on the input, but we're going to match the stack top to the left-hand side of the rule, and we're going to push the right-hand side of the rule. We're going to push BCD onto the stack. Now, you may remember that we're not allowed to push multiple symbols in our definition of pushdown automata, so we have to uh, take care of uh, explaining how we're going to do that, and it's not too difficult. Uh, instead of pushing BCD all at once, we can introduce some additional states in our pushdown automaton that we're designing and uh, use these rules. Okay, here we're matching the A on the stack top and popping it. And then notice we're pushing in reverse order D, C, and B in order to push in the, the correct order. So we push D and then without looking at the input or the stack, we push a C. And then again, without looking at the input or the stack, we push a B. So we start with a starting symbol on the stack, and then we keep applying these rules until we find the right leftmost derivation. And how do we know which rule to use and when to use it? Well, this is the beauty of non-determinism. Our pushdown automata are non-deterministic. So we can imagine that we are able to just guess which transition to take, or we can imagine that somehow we try them all in parallel or uh, on different computers uh, uh, and try all different possibilities. These are six of one and half a dozen of the other. It doesn't matter how you think of it. This is all about non-determinism, and uh, it gives us a lot of power because we don't have to figure out which rule to apply. We can just assume we know which rule to apply. Okay, so now let's imagine that we've got this rule in our grammar and we are building a push on automaton for this grammar. And at some stage in the execution of this push down automaton, we uh, decide to replace A by the right hand side. So here's our stack. Again, I've shown the stack tilted on the side with the dollar sign at the bottom of the stack. And uh, we've pushed the right hand side of the rule 0102B3C onto the stack on top of whatever was already there. We're assuming that uh, 0, 1, and 2, and 3 are terminal symbols, and A, B, C, and so on are the non terminal symbols. And so now what do we do? Well, here we are on the input. Here's the stack. Okay, this is telling us that the next thing in the input string should be 0, 1, 0, 2. And if those are, in fact, the next things in the input, then we need to scan them in advance. Because remember, our, our fundamental rule is to look at the non-terminal on the top of the stack and replace it with its right-hand side. But at this stage, we've just applied, we've, after we do that with A, we end up with a stack that contains something that's not a non-terminal on the top. In this case, we now have a terminal symbol on the top of the stack. So we match it against the input, and we match the terminal symbol to the stack top when we can. So for that, we're going to need uh, rules that look like this. If we see a zero and the stack top is a zero, then pop the stack and advance the input. If we see a one on the top of the stack and the input, we pop the stack and scan the input. Likewise, for every symbol that's in the input alphabet. For every terminal symbol we have one of these edges that does this pop in advance. 
And so this will, using these rules, will scan the input up to this point and will scan, or will pop the stack up to the point of B, the leftmost non-terminal. And then we can make sure that B expands to whatever's here. And then after we do that, we better see a three, which will match. And then the input will be advanced even further. And we'll hopefully, we'll, we have C, so that will be expanded to some string of non-terminals. And that better match what's in here. And so on and so forth until finally we reach the end of the input and the dollar sign. So here is our final machine. Given the grammar with its rules, we can build this push down automaton. It's got a starting state, and the first thing it does is it pushes a dollar sign onto the stack. And then you see at the very end, it makes sure that the stack is empty by popping the dollar sign. The dollar sign is not used elsewhere. It, so the after pushing the dollar sign, what do we do? We push the starting symbol for the grammar. So without scanning any input, and without looking at the stack, we push S, the starting symbol. And then we have one state with lots and lots of transitions. For every rule, we have a transition that ignores the input. And if this non-terminal is on the top of the stack, we pop it and we push onto the stack the right-hand side. Remember, we may have to add several extra states in order to push these symbols uh, individually. But conceptually, our machine has one, two, three, four states with additional states added as necessary to deal with the uh, multiple symbols on the right-hand sides. So for every rule in the grammar of the form A goes to something, we have a transition or sequence of transitions to pop A and push the symbols of the right-hand side. For the input, for the terminal symbols, we have a transition to match each terminal symbol to the same input symbol. So when a symbol A from the alphabet is on the top of the stack, we match A in the input, pop the stack, and advance the input. And we don't push anything onto the stack. So we add a rule x, x goes to epsilon for every x in the alphabet. So that completes the first part of the proof, showing how, given a context-free language, it must have a context-free grammar to describe it. And um, given a context-free grammar, this is how we can construct a push-down automaton that recognizes the same language.